Good morning. Happy New Year. When I got saved in 1971, there was some crazy teaching going around saying the Lord is going to be back by 1978. And uh, things were hotting up in our world. It's now 2017. He could come back any time, but no one knows the hour or the day. So we're going to enjoy 2017, hey? And seize every opportunity that God gives to us to be able to live the life that he wants us to live, glorifying Christ and doing as much good to our fellow man and to endeavour to be a witness of his life and his love and his goodness and his grace that people will see Christ in us and will be attracted to him and that God will touch our lives and work through us to be a, a great witness to many people who need the Lord this year. More than conquerors, what a great title. That comes from Romans, that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Now, I want to share with you from or my thoughts, the launching pad for this series is the book of Joshua. And so for the month of January, for those of you that are following closely, how many have read Joshua chapter 1 already this morning? You've done it. Wow, because for those of you that haven't, we're going to read it together a bit later. And so we're reading the book of Joshua for January and the book of Ephesians together. And so we try to match up the preaching themes with our Bible reading. And for those of you who do the Life Journal, uh, we have these available, don't we, Milan? And they are for free, aren't they? Yes. We're giving them away. Yes. You sure? Yes. That's pretty cheap. So, look, um, we would sooner give them to you if you use them and uh, you can journal. And as you read a chapter, and uh, I, I would sooner read one chapter and to get the book, the chapter on the inside. And we use the SOAP acronym. It's a bit like we all got up this morning, we hope, and washed ourselves and got rid of all the dirt and the sweat. And so... S stands for scripture. We read a chapter and O is observing and God guiding us. And there might be a, a, a verse or there might be a fragment, a couple of words, or it could be a phrase or it could be the whole chapter. You're observing and God is speaking to you. And so A is the application where you're praying, God, how does this apply to me? And then on that page, you can put down that thought and uh, you collect them. And over the years... I look back, in fact, my Bible is, is my journal. So if you look at my Bibles, they're wrecked, absolutely wrecked. And I write stuff on there, answers to prayer, God speaking, this thought, that thought. And uh, so it's important to record, actually, what God is saying and what God is doing and answers to prayer. So I encourage you, at the beginning of this year, if you haven't uh, got this habit of journaling, uh, you can journal in your Bible, wreck your Bible, buy a new one next year, or you can use this and collect it up, but uh, encourage you. So Joshua, and um, what's it about? Let me give you a little bit of an overview. This book of Joshua records the possession of the land of Canaan, which is now present-day Israel and the West Bank and the East Bank, bits of Jordan, bits of Palestinian territory, right along the Mediterranean coast. And uh, it records this. And also the opposition of the local inhabitants, the Canaanites, who were not very nice people. And they opposed Joshua and the Hebrew people every step of the way. For their every forward move, there was pushback by the enemy. In Egypt, the Hebrew people were slaves for something like 400 years. And uh, they had to be submissive under a tyrannical oppression, 400 years. Then God sent a deliverer whose name was Moses, and he led the people out with great liberty and freedom. But they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years between Egypt, between the Nile and going up through to the Jordan Valley 
and getting ready to cross over. So Joshua begins when they're looking at the Jordan River and they can see a massive fortified city called Jericho. But in the wilderness, they were mostly in a defensive position. They were in submission for 400 years, defensive for the next 40 years. And in Canaan, they now had to take the offensive. And it took them around seven years to conquer that land. And uh, do you realise that the entire Christian life actually is about warfare? It's not a Sunday school picnic. Uh, And people sometimes think, oh, I didn't know that. That's why I like to tell the truth right up front when someone comes to Christ. I say, you are entering into a war. It's a war to the end. Um, And it's not to fight to defeat the enemy, the devil and his demons. It's a series of battles to possess the territory that is already ours, but is illegally occupied by a defeated enemy. So as Joshua and the Hebrew people are getting ready, they have received already the promises of God that this land is theirs. And it was promised to them a thousand or so years beforehand, to Abraham, you can read it in Genesis 12, to his son Isaac, to his son Jacob, to his son Joseph, and then to Moses. So this land, God said, this is going to be your land. I've already given it to you. That's my word. That's my promise. But they hadn't actually possessed it. And so hundreds of years had passed between the promise and its fulfillment. Now, Jumping into the New Testament, my favourite letter of all the New Testament writings would have to be what? For those of you that know me, it would be what? Ephesians. And I call this letter the New Testament book of Joshua. There's similarities, though massive differences. There are three words and three verses that help us grasp the essential message of this power-packed six-chapter letter of Paul's. Those three words are wealth, walk, and warfare. Ephesians 1.3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Notice that. All the promises. God says, I have given you promises, like he gave to the Hebrew people. They were going to possess the land. He's saying, hey, you've got a land to possess. I've blessed you in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So now walk, he says. You've got to cross the Jordan. Ephesians 4.1, I urge you to live a life worthy or to walk worthy of the calling you've received. I've called you. There are promises. Now you've got to walk to outwork it. And then there's warfare. Ephesians 6, 10 to 11. In fact, the 10 verses of Ephesians 6 at the end. He says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So the promised land of Canaan is a symbol or a type, as we say, of the heavenly realms that Paul writes about in Ephesians. The Canaanite nations, the kings and the armies, and there's about 32 of them, I think 32 kings and uh, and armies that Joshua has to go against in the seven-year period. They're a type or a symbol of Satan and demonic powers that we're in conflict with. And and the final verses of Ephesians that we just read that, that one verse, it talks to us that we have a struggle with evil spirits. But notice, when you read Ephesians, he gives three chapters about our wealth, who we are in Jesus Christ your new standing, your new identity in him, what God has done for you through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Chapters 1 through to chapter 3. And then chapter 4, right through to chapter 6, verse 9, he talks about how to walk the Christian life. Once you know your position in him and the amazing blessings that are now ours through Jesus, not because of anything we've done, but because of what he has done, now you can walk in victory. The revelation and insight of who you now are in him transforms your thinking from what you were to now you say, this is who I am and who I'm becoming. And then Paul just has 10 verses, the second half of chapter 6, on the devil. 
In other words, he's saying, if you know your wealth, you know the promises of God, and you start walking in the light of those promises, well, the enemy is easy to deal with. You just say, get lost in Jesus' name. You just move forward. So the warfare that we have is actually easy, and we can deal with the enemy and move him aside from our lives and from our circumstances when we understand our wealth and we're walking in the light of what we now are in Christ, then our warfare becomes easier. So as we walk the Christian life with the full armour of God on, we're actually invading the domain of Satan's sphere. And our prayers and our faith walk and our obedience push away our enemy as we enforce his defeat through Jesus Christ. And so in Joshua, we're encouraged to actually become more than conquerors. And over the next several weeks, we're going to be opening this up by getting to know this God of great promises, by moving forward with confident and courageous faith in this miracle-working God, by living in God's priceless and powerful word, by developing a new mindset that views all of life from God's perspective, and by making fresh starts with God that deepen our dependence upon him. And as we read the book of Joshua, you see that actually being outworked, particularly in the first six or seven chapters. Just before Christmas, I'm writing a note to our ministry directors and our pastors, and I'm thinking about Joshua, the book of Ephesians, and the series that I'm preparing here for you. And it it just hit me, actually, that our church now is entering into its 41st year. And we actually have a Joshua generation that's being raised up in the life of the church. A lot of our ministry leaders and, and, and pastors and developing pastors are in their 20s and 30s. Some of us are in our 60s and some still are in their, some of the old boys are in their 70s. I won't mention Ian Hunter's name and Alan Steele's name and, <laughs> and others like that. And, uh, and I wrote this little note to them. This thought, I thought I'd read it to you. Thinking of you as I get ready for our two Christmas services. I'm so appreciative to be serving Jesus with such a fine group of men and women of God. The Lord has raised you up for such a time as this. And the fruit of your life and ministry is very obvious to me. And you see that in Sam and Tanya and Lockie and Stacey and Adrian and Nathan and and, uh, all, all of our younger leaders that are operating in the life of the church. Thank you for your personal support in how God is directing me at this era of my life and as we endeavor to lead our seat in CFC forward to possess all the promises that God has spoken to us over the years. Thanks also for allowing Tim Lockins to lead you with Cass's capable, Cass Tompage's capable assistance in the new leadership arrangements we put in place this year, which we did in the beginning of 2016. It has freed me a lot to do those things that are really important in God to embrace, for me to embrace, for the benefit of Seton here, our sister CFC churches, our CRC denominational family that we belong to, and the wider body of Christ here in Australia and in other nations. I feel like The first 40 years is just foundational to what God really wants to do through us in this new generation. I'm reflecting a lot about the Joshua generation as I prepare our January series regarding overcoming. Most of you are of this new generation and the rest of us are crossing over from the 40 year Moses generation. Some of us are bridging the two. And you know, For those of us in the Moses generation, and I forgot to mention Philip and Janet Bryce, they're in the Moses generation. (laughs) But Janet hasn't cracked 60 yet, she's still a young girl. But Philip's the old boy, he's cracked 60 like me. um, But you know what, what we would say to the younger generation is don't shift ever from the changeless center. Keep the foundations laid by the Moses generation. And, and, and this has to do with proclaiming the gospel, the good news about Jesus' free grace. It's free grace, not cheap grace. Free grace. And how now we can receive all the benefits and blessings of what he has accomplished for us through his life, death and resurrection. And now we outwork that in this new generation with new strategies and 
It says in the beginning of this chapter, which we read, Moses, my servant, is now dead. And you read that and you think, why did you include that in there? He's getting the point across saying, you know what? He's dead. He's gone. You're it, Joshua. You young blokes, you young girls, you're it. And then he reminds them and says, hey, but don't deviate from God's law. Don't deviate from the changeless center. You can change everything else and you can move forward in a new generation. New ideas, new strategies, new tactics. Joshua couldn't rely upon the tactics that Moses used in the wilderness. This is a new thing. There are 32 kings that have to be bumped off and eliminated. And so he is now going, ah, what do I do? And, and God says to him, listen, I'll be with you as I was with Moses. Because, but now you've got to trust me. But make sure the word of God, the law of God is in your foundations. And Joshua, from the chapter 1, God says, be careful to, to stay true to the, to the word. And then at the end of Joshua, when he's an old man and he's about to pass it on to the next generation, he goes, guys, remember Moses? Remember his law? Remember what God says? Don't deviate from it. The tragedy is the leaders that came after Joshua went downhill. You read the book of Judges and they backslid. They fell away. That generation lost its way. Not the Joshua generation, but the next generation. And so what a challenge for the Joshua generation to make sure that their kids and their grandkids have that same foundation. The tendency for human beings is to stray and to shift from the centrality of Jesus Christ, the foundation of his word, centering around the gospel of grace, not the gospel of law, not the gospel of do it your own way and bring some humanistic technique in to somehow change people's lives. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked for me. <laughs> Only the raw power of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ, the giving of the Holy Spirit can change the human heart. And so, so that's my little encouragement that I got just before Christmas that I sent to our leaders. And all those younger leaders said, do I hear an amen? Yeah, yeah. I'm teasing you. Now for those of you that haven't read Joshua chapter 1, I think we should read it together. What do you reckon? And do you know what they did in the Old Testament? Oftentimes, the word was so important. In fact, I've been doing some intense study on Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Malachi, Zechariah and, and Haggai in that post-exilic period of when the people were taken captive and then when they came back. And I loved with Ezra, it says that he gets up to read the scripture and they all stood up for six hours to read the word. So do you reckon you could stand up for two minutes? Why don't we show our reverence and stand before the word of God as we read it together? Let's look at in the message translation. It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of God, God spoke to Joshua, Moses' assistant. Moses, my servant, is dead. Get going. Cross this Jordan River, you and all the people. Cross to the country I'm giving to the people of Israel. I'm giving you every square inch of the land you set your foot on, just as I promised Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon east to the great river, the Euphrates River. All the Hittite country. And then west to the great sea, Mediterranean, right through the Euphrates, which is Syria, Iraq, right up to modern day Turkey. All your life, no one will be able to hold out against you. In the same way I was with Moses, I will be with you. I won't give up on you. I won't leave you. Strength, courage, my boy. You're going to lead this people to inherit the land that I promised to give their ancestors. Give it everything you have, heart and soul. Make sure you carry out the revelation that Moses commanded you. Every bit of it. Don't get off track either left or right, so as to make sure you get to where you're going. And don't for a minute let this book of the Revelation, this is the first five books of the, the Old Testament, be out of mind. Ponder and meditate on it day and night, making sure you practice everything written in it. Then you'll get where you're going. Then you'll succeed. Haven't I commanded you? Strength, courage. Don't be timid. Don't get discouraged. God, your God is with you every step you take. 
Then Joshua gave orders to the people's leaders. Go through the camp and give this order to the people. Pack your bags. In three days you will cross the Jordan River to enter and take the land God, your God, is giving you to possess. Then Joshua addressed the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. He said, remember what Moses, the servant of God, commanded you. God, your God, gives you rest and he gives you this land. Your wives, your children, your livestock can stay here east of the Jordan, the country Moses gave you. But you, tough soldiers all, must cross the river in battle formation, leading your brothers, helping them until God, your God, gives your brothers a place of rest just as he has done for you. They also will take possession of the land that God, your God, is giving them. Then you will be free to return to your possession, given to you by Moses, the servant of God, across the Jordan in the east. They answered Joshua, everything you commanded us, we'll do. I love this. Wherever you send us, we'll go. Oh, every lead pastor loves this verse. Everything you command us, we'll do. Whoa. Wherever you send us, we'll go. We obeyed Moses to the letter, we'll obey you. And we just pray that God, your God, will be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone who questions what you say and refuses to obey whatever you command him will be put to death. Oh, I like that one. <laughs> we'll have a few dead bodies around here over the years. Oh, no, no, no. Thankfully, we live in the New Testament. We've got to interpret it within its context, don't we? Strength and courage. Isn't that a great chapter? You can be seated. Be thankful you're not standing for six hours like in Ezra's time. <laughs> Folks, the land was God's gifts to his people. And he mentions it several times in the first chapter. You read it carefully. Verse 2, verse 4, verse 6, verse 13. All the way through. Israel, the Hebrew people, had to constantly remember that the land was rightfully theirs. And God rep repeatedly has promised it to them. And so you, you just read Genesis all the way through. He's always saying, my word, my word, my word. This is a promise. I'm giving it to you. Even though it hadn't been realized. God found it necessary. It's the part that blows me away. He found it necessary to continually reaffirm this to them. And to give them further revelation about this great promise. You see, the biggest problem God has with us is our believing. Are we believing the right way or are we believing the wrong way? Will we trust his word? Will we trust in the integrity of his character that he is true to his word, that he'll outwork his promises? And I think the Lord is, is saying to us, he, said, he repeats it so often, so often, right from Abraham right through to here, and you read chapter 1, of Joshua, and he says it again, the game, the game, to get it through to them. All Christians and all churches, including the Christian Family Centre, as we enter our 41st year of our existence, we need to be reminded about the inheritance that is rightfully and legally ours through faith in Jesus Christ. Continually. You cannot walk the Christian life. You will fall over. You will bloody yourself. You will break your nose. You'll break an arm. You will not be able to walk the Christian life. And I've been walking it for 45 years in your own strength, by your own thought power. Oh, if I just change my attitude. No, 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 no. It's not a new attitude. It's a new spirit you need, a new life force. You need the life of God within you to empower you. People say, oh, it's just willpower. No, it's not. It's spirit power. The scripture says, for it's God who is at work in you. I love the Amplified Version. Where is this? Philippians 2.13. Which says, effectually working in you, creating in you the very desire to want to do his will. I can't do his will in my own strength. I need his desires, his life force within me to, to, to grab this wild man will to bend it to obey the will of God because my sinful nature will want to do the wrong thing. And I don't need someone to tell me you need new attitudes and you just change your behaviour and God will be happy with you. You just change your attitude and God will be happy with you. No, God is happy with us when we yield ourselves to Jesus Christ and see the completeness of what he has done on his cross 
And through rising from the dead and now giving the gift of the Holy Spirit, he gives us the gift of forgiveness, eternal life, peace, and a new power source to be able to live the life he wants us to live. And that's why he's saying, I'm going to remind you time and time again, he's saying to, to, the, to us through, through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua here, what is rightfully and legally yours through the promise of God. And for us, through the life and death and resurrection and ongoing ministry of Jesus Christ. Let me read this New Testament verse, which I think is, is, is a beauty. 2 Corinthians 1 says this, But as surely as God is faithful... This is one some of you ought to memorize. Our message to you is not yes and no, maybe if. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silas and Timothy, and by Bill Vasilakis here over 38 years, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And all that we have to do is we say, Amen, so be it. I agree. <laughs> I accept it. I believe it. I receive it. It's not a work. It's an attitude of faith of saying, I receive. I respond. The entire New Testament tells us that all of God's purposes flow to the cross and that all of God's purposes flow from the cross of Christ. He died in our place to save us. He rose from the grave and lives to bless his people with the gifts of forgiveness and eternal life and the Holy Spirit. We have an eternal hope, folks, for all our tomorrows. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. It's 2017. You don't know what your tomorrows are going to bring. But I tell you what, we can have an eternal hope through Jesus Christ and we have endless help for all our todays. That's what he's saying to Joshua. He said, I'm going to be with you. He goes, just think about it. He goes, you've got hope. I'm, I'm giving you hope for your future. But I'm providing help for today. If you don't know Christ here on this first Sunday of a new year, don't leave today without receiving him. If you have some need of a, of a miracle of God's intervention and you've tried everything in your own effort, then there's no answer. Get your eyes on Jesus. We would love to pray with you. There's nothing impossible for our God to do. We have the right to possess every provision made available for us through Jesus Christ. Look at this verse here. Ephesians 1.3 Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. This is the key verse of the whole book of, of Ephesians, the six chapters. So the Greek word for praise be, blessed and blessing is, is the Greek word called evloia. And we call it eulogy, eulogio. Where we get the word eulogy. So you know, at, at a wedding and a funeral we give eulogies. We now call them tributes. <laughs> Tribute sort of thinking and you know what it means it means speaking well of it means a good utterance it means good thinking concerning us so God eulogizes us as he sees us in Christ he speaks well of us he thinks highly of us he makes good utterances and he has good thoughts concerning us he doesn't eulogize us in our unregenerate Adamic state but in as much as we've accepted Christ he now sees us in his son have you ever been to a funeral or a wedding where there was a bad eulogy? Very rare. Well, actually, I have too. And they're stinkers of events. Like, you're supposed to think the best thoughts about the deceased person. Look, they may have been a bit rough around the edges. They may have done some things wrong. But you try and focus on the good things, don't you? And weddings. Oh, you ever been to a wedding where they speak negatively of the bride and the groom? I have, and it's all full. Weddings and funerals is a time where you think about the person. So I say to our trainee pastors, look, you can make a mistake on a Sunday because you can get up the next Sunday and correct it. But you can't for a wedding or a funeral. It's a once-off event. So write everything down. No guesswork. <laughs> because you want to think the best thoughts. And so... 
You eulogize the person. You, you speak well of them. You have fine thoughts about them. That's the Greek word. When God says, blessed be, look at Ephesians 1, 3 again. Praise be. Ephesians 1, 3, again, back where we were. Wake up, you had a late night last night, I can tell. I know who you are. Oh, it's going to be terrible. Lord, forgive me. <laughs> Praise be to the God. Well spoken of be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us, who has eulogized us, spoken well of us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Wow. We need to know what our spiritual inheritance is before we can claim these promises by faith. You see, if appropriating faith is going to be activated in us, we've got to have knowledge and insight from the word, from the scripture, to lay as a foundation. Let me give you just, just several verses here. I'll, I'll list them down here. This is what God says about you. Just list all those scriptures down. Some positive promises from God. How God sees us now in Christ. Okay? These are provisions and blessings that are all past tense. It's what God has provided for us through Jesus Christ. And these tell us who we now are in Christ and what we now have through Christ. I'll say that again. These tell us who we now are in Christ. I don't care what your own thinking says. The little scripts and the voices and the tapes going on in the back of your mind might be saying, no, no, not true, not true, not true, not true. As I go through these, if those voices start speaking, that's the devil. That is the devil who has sown some stuff in you or some trauma or something in the past that's kind of locked in there. And I want to rip those tapes out. And I want to rewrite it. Because this is the truth. This is what God says about you. Okay? It's who we now are in Christ and what we now have through him. I am forgiven and cleansed from sin. Now you can say some amens to these if you like. Get a bit excited. We have some of our African brothers here. That's the reason why there's no noise. There's no Africans here. I am forgiven and cleansed from sin. Oh, I am without blemish, free from accusation. I've been delivered and set free from the old life. I'm a new creation. I'm a child of God. I'm accepted by God. I'm made righteous. I'm God's workmanship. I'm complete in Christ. I'm enthroned with Christ. I reign in life. I have the power, presence and peace of God in my life. I have God's healing covenant to draw from. I have provision from God's material supply. I have authority over all the power of Satan and I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. Wow! Isn't that something? <laughs> Folks, I'm trying to prod you this morning. Just like God prodded the Israelites of old about what God has spoken to us about. That we are in Christ and his promises are irrevocable. God's promises are inseparably linked with his faithfulness and he never changes. His word cannot be broken. I feel so excited about this that two years ago I did a series on, on January called The Me I Can Be. Well, I've actually written that series up and Pastor Ray Betcher did the final chapter and we've actually produced a book. It's called... The me, I can be. Who we can become through Jesus Christ. We've just published it. We're going to make it available on the first Sunday of February here. And uh, there's only six chapters. And, and what I've tried to do, it's about 96, just under 100 pages. I didn't want it to be long. I didn't want it to be 400. I want it to be a guide of victory. To give it to somebody who's struggling in this area. And I share about my own journey, the first four years. I remember back, it's like, was I really like that? 17 to 21, 22, of the struggles that I had and how God taught me to overcome. And then at the end of each chapter, I have a long testimony of somebody who I've known for 20 plus years. So that it's somebody who's not going to backslide and fall away, but has tested, over time has been tested. And those stories are heart-rending stories. I'm trusting that uh, the only reason I've, I've written it is I want to help people. And we're selling it, I think, for what, $15? And then when I go to Papua New Guinea and overseas, I'll sell it for 
five bucks because I'm not wanting to make a profit. I just want to cover the costs. But I just see that even the testimonies, I think when people read them, they might ring through and say, I'd like to talk to that person that experienced that. So I have testimonies from great people. And one of the people that I've asked to share, particularly in this first chapter about our new identity, is, is Penny Hamble. Now, I've known Bruce and Penny for 20 plus years, and they are two of the finest people you can ever meet. I mean, they're, they're the ideal converts. If every convert could be like them, it makes a pastor's life a dream. And uh, they are fantastic people. But Penny's story, when you read it in the book, is pretty powerful. And I've asked her to actually come and share what I'm saying about our new identity in Christ. To share, Penny, come, put your hands together for Penny as she <laughs> shares with us. Wasn't that, I, am I on? Yep, yep. Wasn't that a powerful message? Yes. A absolutely powerful, uplifting message. And I hope everybody um, has taken something from that. Um, I want to share my story. And, Just hold um, closer and speak louder. My entrance into this world was a rather traumatic one, not just for me, but for my mum. Um, I was a breech birth with the umbilical cord tied around my neck, um, and so I obviously couldn't move, so I didn't move from that position. So once I was born, um, my mum didn't see me for about three days, so she never really bonded with me, I don't think. I was a hyperactive child, I never slept, I was asthmatic, and my memories of my mum were of her, or her always being frustrated, resentful and angry with me. She always told me I was a horrible child, which I probably was. I feared and felt rejected by her and outwardly though, all seemed well. I was well fed, well dressed and kept busy with weekend um, activities as I got older. I'm the eldest of three children and um, my mother had RH negative blood and I had positive. So when my brother was born, he was critically ill. Both my mother and my um, brother almost died. In actual fact, he was the first with this condition to ever be saved. And when my mum would, um, you know, talk about this, it was like it was because of my blood my positive blood caused all these antibodies in her blood. So I was responsible and I felt very guilty and, um, and resentful. I'm sure she didn't mean that to be the way, but that's the way it was. Both my parents served in the services um, in the Second World War. My father fought in Borneo under terrible conditions and my mum served in the Air Force and she was based, I think, in Darwin and Melbourne and different places. My dad um, suffered with terrible post-traumatic stress syndrome so badly that um, when I was a child he was hospitalised um, twice for months at a time and had to undergo shock treatment. So I think my mum's um, time with young children was a very stressful one. She didn't cope very well. And as I look back, I'm sure um, she was suffering with um, great depression. Um, my dad, like many ex-servicemen, took to alcohol uh, to numb the pain. My memories of him when I was young was um, he was never home at night. I can remember as I got older hearing terrible arguments and things as I lay in bed because, as I said, I didn't sleep, so I could hear everything. Um, yeah, he had a, a terrible time, but he was a good, a good man. He loved my mum. He loved his family. But due to his problems, he found life very difficult, and my mum obviously did as well. One thing I remember about my dad, we never had a meal together at night uh, through the week because he wasn't home. He'd always come home late, mum would heat his, his meal up. And as I got older, I'd wait for him to come home and I'd sit on his chair, you know, and the smell of cigarettes and beer are the familiar smells that um, I relate to my dad. Um, mum never worked, dad had a very good job, so he was a good provider. 
Um, we were a Catholic family, um, though we went to church every week, every Sunday growing up. Christianity wasn't a part of our day-to-day -day lives. I um, went to a Catholic school, and both primary and high school, and uh, the nuns were extremely cruel, to say the least. Not all of them, but, you know, there were a number that were and made life um, hell, really. Um, so my view of God was very, very tarnished. Uh, on one hand, we were being taught about the love of Jesus and how he died and gave his life for us. And I always remember that beautiful photo of Jesus with the Sacred Heart. And that's the Jesus that I really wanted to know. But we were also um, punished if we were less than perfect. You know, um, punishment was a, you know, the, uh, punching on the back or caning or, you know, just terrible things, trying to beat perfection into us and of course perfect, perfect I could never be but I was also frightened of God because we were taught back in those days that even if you ate meat on a Friday you would go to hell it was a mortal sin so my goodness if God was going to send you to hell for eating meat I had no hope so I stopped going to church when I was about 16 and, and none of my family went except for Christmas and um, Easter. And my, my parents didn't even do that. Um, as a child, I didn't get any um, positive affirmation um, from home. My mother didn't believe in... Um, praising children. She didn't think it was good for them. So we never had any praise whatsoever. But I did get a lot of attention from men. You know, um, as I said, I was craving the love of a father because he was not home. And um, always, wherever I went, um, men always gave me a lot of attention. And we had new neighbours that moved next door and uh, they were childless and had two beautiful dogs. So we became friendly and um, over time I was going in there like every afternoon after school and on weekends, etc. And over time, this man started to tell me how much he loved me and I was like the daughter that he never had. And uh, he started to molest me. And this um, continued uh, for quite some time. I never spoke to it about it to anybody and I kept it to myself. But I always felt confused. Um, I didn't really understand what love was. And, you know, I, I made many mistakes. I married at a, a very young age um, to a man who was about 10 years older than me and we worked together. And again, my first um, uh, connection with him was the smell of beer and cigarettes. He smelt like my dad. And that was the attraction. So we married and the best thing that came out of that marriage was two beautiful children. He was an alcoholic. He was never home at night. He could never be relied on um, for anything really. And uh, so life with him wasn't fantastic. So I left him after 10 years and I remarried to my wonderful husband, Bruce. Um, life in the beginning was not fantastic either because Bruce um, came down with also post-traumatic stress um, that affected him due to his time in Vietnam. So, you know, we had a few problems, um, but they were resolved. I um, was working at a large department store, but when we were going through all these things and, and uh, the life that I'd had, I was always asking the questions, why are we here? What is this life all about? You know, we were born, we go to work, we earn money, we buy things, and then we die and leave them to our children, and then and so the cycle um, continues. And what is the point of it all? And an, in God's wonderful timing, and his timing is always perfect, a girl that I was working with had, had left 
and she was not working for about 12 months and then she came back to work and, and she was placed under me. Before that, I didn't know she was a Christian at all and she started to witness to me about Jesus and everything in me jumped for joy. I believed what she was saying. It was just a, a wonderful time. She gave me a tract which I, I took home and I was reading it one Thursday morning. I'll never forget it, reading this tract. And I had a suddenly Jesus moment where my whole life changed. I laughed, I cried. I looked for a Bible. I didn't know if we had one. I found one in my daughter's cupboard from school and didn't know if it was a Bible or not because it said the good news. But when I opened it and it said in the beginning, I knew it was a Bible. And good news it was. And... um, I read that thing from beginning to end. The words just jumped out at me, the word of God, his love and his grace and his mercy. That particular afternoon I was starting work at midday. I left home. The sky was bluer than blue. The flowers were brighter than bright. The grass was greener than green. Everything was new, just everything was totally new. I was on cloud nine and my life changed dramatically from then. Bruce thought, um, this will change. This is a fad. I went to church every Sunday morning, no matter where we'd been the night before. I was up early, I'd be at church. So after six months, Bruce decided he was going to come with me. And so he came the first time, but then he didn't come for another six months. But when he did, he came down and gave his life to Christ. Together we were baptised, we joined a home group, we did every course that um, Seton had to offer and Bill was um, amazing. He helped me through. I'd never spoken of what happened to me as a child until I told told, um, Bill and he helped me immensely. But this church was just a godsend for me. Bruce ended up doing a a Bachelor of Ministry and became a pastor and a church planter. So our lives, you know, totally, totally changed. My um, parents, um, because they were, you know, interstate, every time we'd bring them over or they'd come over for a holiday... My mum wouldn't come to church, but my dad always did. We, um, we had planted a church and he came to that church with us whenever he was here. And he really loved it. He came here to Seton a couple of times and I believe he made a commitment on a card uh, one Easter um, when we used to do the Passion of Christ. My mum, the Lord told me to tell her I love her. And I think we were in Singapore in the, in the airport and I rang her at my sister's, I think it might have been Mother's Day, and I rang her there and told her I loved her. And from that day on, I told her I loved her every time I spoke to her. I did everything I possibly could for my mum while she was alive. When she was dying, I, um, I spent many weeks Um, with her sitting in the hospital trying to feed her and um, give her fluid. I read the Gospel of John to her and I do believe she could hear because I saw her praying. She called out to the Lord and I I do believe she's with him now. And, uh, you know, the Lord is just so good and so faithful He makes all things new. And the Lord is love and his grace and his mercy is uh, all around us and it abounds in us. And my desire is that everybody would know the joy of his favour and the new life that is only found in him. And the verse I'd like to share with you this morning that the Lord gave to me in the early hours of this morning is Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. And this spoke to me so much when I was um, a new Christian. Come to me, all of you who are weary and tired of carrying a heavy load. Come, 
and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in spirit and I will give you rest for your soul. For the yoke I'll give you is easy and my burden is light. And there may be some people here today that are holding burdens. You may have had similar childhood to me. I'm sure there's been many people in, in a similar position to me. But God is the same yesterday, today and forever. He's the God of change. He makes all things new and in him you can be a new creation. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Very good. That's wonderful. Thank you.